Perhaps nine-tenths of the trials of Travniki men who had served in the extermination camps of Aksion Reinhardt occurred long after they returned home and settled back into civilian life. For most of them, their luck was to be convicted after suspension of the death penalty, May 1947, for three years, which also meant that those who outlived Joseph Stalin would see freedom again. How, the, how were these men caught in the first place? That is, how did Soviet law enforcement operate immediately after the war? Simply by the systematic collection and cross-referencing of information and its exploitation on a national scale that derived directly from methods that the surveillance state had developed in previous decades. Every Soviet citizen displaced in the course of the war from Soviet territory to German-controlled areas and re-entering Soviet territory after war's end passed through what was called filtration. Former Travniki men funneled into this screening through various routes. The former extermination camp guards had either deserted from the system with growing frequency after January 1943, or had continued to serve until 1945 at gar as guards at the Reich's other concentration camps. At that point, they disposed of their weapons, identification documents, and uniforms, and blended into the ocean of displaced East European humanity that filled the road leading out of Germany. In every case, the displaced person entered a holding camp for screening. Some of these camps were in Red Army occupied border areas, and some were internal labor camps in Russia's far north or the Central Asian republics. During the screening of displaced persons, a military or an NKVD official recorded identification and family information, details of how the person ended up on Germany's territory at war's end, a chronology of their whereabouts and activity, and identification of witnesses or others whom the subject might wish to denounce. The investigator created at least two documents, a four-page questionnaire and a small kartochka on each person. If the subject's biographical data were open to question, a separate interrogation took place. The first arrestees appear to have been uniformly distributed in the western border areas, especially the former Polish territories of Galicia and the western reaches of the pre-war Ukraine. This was facilitated by a reinforced security presence and martial law in those areas, even after the peacetime administration returned to the rest of Soviet life after September 1945. The borderlands remained in a state of war as a result of nationalist insurrection created by armed movements that resisted imposition of Soviet power. Smirsch's interrogations of Travniki men in 1944 launched cases in Ivano-Frankivsk, formerly Stanislavov, and Lviv, formerly Lviv. In early 1946, which in turn produced further allegations against extermination camp guards elsewhere. By 1947, cases were appearing in eastern Siberia and in Central Asia. The circle of investigative activity spread outward across the breadth of the USSR as a drop of oil on a calm lake. While filtration and screening created a perfectly defined and described population of potential traders returning to their villages and towns, central security offices in Moscow exploited captured documents, so-called trophy documents, from the Travniki system and extracted the identities of Soviet citizens who had served, including at the extermination camps. By early 1946, Moscow had begun to disseminate to each oblast NKVD office lists of, quote, traitors, unquote, to be investigated and prosecuted. 
In one set of cases, the crop of so-called traitors was almost too easy to harvest. In 1947, Soviet military investigators in ivano frankivsk oblasts handled hundreds of young, frequently semi-literate Ukrainian men recruited as civilians to Travniki in the spring of 1943. 25 years uh, at hard labor was the uniform sentence. In contrast, the former Red Army prisoners of war who had operated the extermination centers came from pre-1939 Soviet territory and they returned to that vast expanse. However, for reasons related to 1941 Soviet conscription and mobilization patterns and German recruitment patterns, most were Soviet Ukrainian citizens. This would bear heavily on a later phase of trials, as we shall see. In the 1940s, Soviet investigator Nets caught former servicemen from the Baltic Republics, from the German settlements along the Dnieper, Don, and Volga rivers, and from across Siberia who had served in the Reinhardt killing centers. Stalin's death had brought a legal pause on use of Article 58, as Soviet judicial reformers stumbled forward with an ambitious goal of reforming the criminal and civil codes devised originally in the 1920s. Notions of criminality derived from revolutionary experience, now 30 years old, underpinned the worst aspects of the criminal code, and turned criminal investigations into political prosecutions. All this needed to change, and the introduction of rudimentary due process produced a fundamental change in the way criminal investigators gathered evidence and established guilt. The redrawn codes of criminal law and procedure had a profound effect on the quality of evidence produced in the course of the investigations and the very nature of accountability. And while the, hint of, while the hunt of, collabor of four collaborators had dropped off dramatically with Stalin's passing, the new law and a renewed search for accountability among a younger generation of investigators and prosecutors produced good records of trials of former Travniki men who engaged in Aksion Reinhardt's very worst crimes. Indeed, aside from the trials of this particular category of perpetrators, the post-1960 Soviet criminal prosecution record contains but a sprinkling of unusual and individualized war crimes cases. Four known groups after 1959, group trials after 1959, conducted under the revised criminal code using Article 54.1, established not only the guilt of former Soviet Red Army soldiers in the Reinhardt crimes at Treblinka, Sobibor, and Belzhets, and Auschwitz-Birkenau, the trial of Schultz and 11 others in Kiev, in Belzhets, in Sobibor, in the forced labor camp at Lemberg, Lviv, and ghetto clearings in Lublin and Warsaw, Matvienko and five others in Krasnodar, in Belzhets and Auschwitz-Birkenau extermination camps, Zuyev and six others in Dnepropetrovsk, and at Belzhets and Lublin ghetto clearance, Akaman and others at Krasnodar. Each trial consisted of dozens of volumes when completed and hundreds of defendant and witness interrogations containing a great amount of detail. The case records also contain whole volumes of translations of trophy documents, forensic evidence, crime scene analysis, psychological expert reports, and other diverse material. Among these men, the pathway between one conviction under Stalin era law and the next was particularly interesting. One man had received 25 years uh, imprisonment at hard labor in August 1952 from a military tribunal in Transcarpathian Oblast that had reduced to 10 years for his high, quote, labor productivity, unquote, in February 1955, 
and had been released in December 1955 under the recent amnesty law. As evidence emerged in the Schultz investigation, a deputy chief military prosecutor had all prior decisions set aside and the case remanded for a new investigation. It is probable that the origins of most cases after 1959 followed a similar course. Of the men convicted and executed, only one, Emanuel Schultz, had not previously been identified, tried, and convicted. Yet a careful examination of these case files shows that witnesses whose testimony convicted the defendants had themselves never been accountable. Indeed, among all Soviet Travniki-related trials after 1959, I have identified nine men who appeared as witnesses, but themselves never been investigated or convicted. As a significant population of war criminals, the Travniki trained former Soviet prisoners of war uh, are probably the ones most thoroughly held to account by the state after 1944. While the surveillance state failed to achieve a perfect record of identifying and locating these men, and although many served sentences far short proportional to their crimes, nevertheless the justice dealt out by the organs of state security, particularly in Ukraine, was far-reaching far and well within the bounds of rough justice. And the cases have withstood well the review of time. Until today, no former Travniki man convicted after liberation has received uh, rehabilitation, even in nationalist Ukraine, where hundreds of Soviet convictions were overturned during the 1990s. On behalf of David Rich, I would like to thank you very much for listening to his paper and yield the floor back to Arthur Podgorsky.